Julian, good evening. <laughs> good evening, Mike. How are you? You all right? I'm all right. Yeah, fine. How are you? I'm, I'm all right. I'm a, I'm a little bit overawed, actually. Are you? Why is that? Well, did you not tell me a moment ago that this is yeah, episode yeah. 25? Episode 25 is the grand old quarter century of Henry Ramblings. Episode 25 of Veterinary Ham Ramblings. Well, welcome everybody. I haven't got enough fingers and toes to count that, that I? I know. Well, I can remember because it's, it's exactly my age. Oh, well, yeah. doubled plus a few. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I've... No, only... hold on. That's the wrong way around. That, that would make me about 11 or 12. So, no, it's the other way around. With a ways about. You can't be 11 or 12. I mean, I'm, I'm the one that's only had 14 birthdays. <laughs> this, is, this is sadly true, isn't it? It is. <laughs> I, 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 twist, I twist the whole 29th of February thing, because that is my genuine birthday. I, I twist it like a, like a, like a twisty thing. Like so, a twisty, daggery thing. Oh, you, you're not going to get off the hook. You know, when it's not a leap year, of course... I celebrate on the 28th and the 1st. Yay! And then, of course, when it is the 29th, big celebrations because it's the 29th and I only get to do this once every four years. Yay! Fantastic. Well, better than my poor twin sister, who, um, uh, by a twist of fate, was, was born. So I was born on the 2nd of August, but she was born on the, on the 32nd of July. So um, she doesn't really get many birthdays. Cool thing. How does that work? I don't know. My mum told us it when we were growing up, and it, it seemed to make some sense then. And your sister still loves you, doesn't she? She still loves me. Hi, gigs. Happy I'll non-birthday. Raise, I'll, raise a, I'll raise a glass there too as well. Happy <laughs> birthdays that you've missed. And you shouldn't listen to what your mum says. <laughs> Rages. Hi. I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Hey, so so, do we have anyone special for our 25th anniversary, darling? Well, I, I think we do. I think we do. Um, she's a lovely lady. She's, she's a vet that sort of has set out to carve her niche in... Um, <laughs> In her in her area, she she considers herself a GP. Um, mm. She qualified from the RVC in about two thousand nine. Um, right. Has worked in general practices around Norfolk, but she then went and did the European School of Veterinary Postgraduate Studies General Practitioner Certificate in Ooh. Exotic Animal Practice. In exotics. <gasps> Fantastic. Now that that was about two thousand twelve. Yeah. And she then did the advanced practitioner of zoological medicine from the RVC in mm. 2017. Wow. Now, while she's been doing all of this wild study and, and getting all of these extra certifications and building her skills and, and doing all of this, she's also set up and started her own small animal practice first opinion um in norfolk in norfolk in norfolk. Well, that's beautiful isn't it in norfolk and i think what we should do is when she when she arrives we'll get her in because one of the things i, I visited the practice not long after that it opened and one of the things that struck me particularly was at the end of the long corridor is a special <clears throat> suite and we'd perhaps better ask her what's at the end of the long corridor and she can tell us that's all. What's in room 101? Indeed. Do, 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 do. But our guest tonight is called Faye Bethel. Ah. And here Faye. It's Faye. Faye's and here. Faye, turn your camera on. <laughs> so so after 25 episodes, we still haven't quite got it right, have we? I was going to say, 20, 25 episodes of practising to make it perfect, so that when Faye uh -huh. joins us, we've just nailed it. It's taken a while, hasn't it? It has, hasn't it? I, th I think more gin is required at this point. <laughs> There's Faye. Faye's Faye. magically appeared. <laughs> Faye, it's, it's, just great, it's just great to see you. It really is. Well, welcome to Veterinary Good. Ramblings. 
really good to meet you, Faith. Thank you. Cheers. Very well. Have you got? Have you got Cheers. a drink? You've got a drink. What, well, now, what is that? That's in a mug. Is that? Is that it's vodka? fruit tea. It's vodka. Not vodka. <laughs> it's probably vodka. And she's, she's, I, I was doing that this morning. I was, I was in a big Zoom meeting this morning, and I thought, how am I going to get away with this? And I thought, I know what I do. I'll carry, I'll put it in a mug, and then I just yep. add, add reality. I can blow over it as if I'm cooling it down. Good idea. Oh, yes. Good plan. Yeah. Good plan. <laughs> Gosh, this this coffee is still quite hot. Is it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Mine too. And mm. mine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in, in the introduction, Faith, which, which unfortunately you 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 missed, um, <laughs> I was I was describing your clinic to to Julian, and how um, you you built this general practitioner's clinic, first opinion, small animal practice, and in my opinion, you've laid it out better than a lot of the, the bigger hospitals and referral centres. Um, but there is a one long central corridor. Yeah. And there's a room at the end of that central corridor. Room 101, there I call is. it. And to, to build up the suspense, I wouldn't tell Julian what you've got. In room. <laughs> what have Shall you got I break the suspense? Again? Is he allowed to know? Yeah, yeah. go on, go on. Please, 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 please. I don't cope well with suspense. I'm target led. Well, her name is Lily, and she's a light speed CT scanner. <gasps> wow, fantastic. Now, wouldn't you like fantastic. one of those, Julian? I would I would love a CT scanner. Well, I, was, so, I was talking to, to Julian earlier about um, we, we'd met before, but then we really started to interact um, sometime in 2014, wasn't it? Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'd been unfortunate enough in my in my career to have had to deal with the the press and um in, in another life i was manager of one of the british ski teams and so you had to deal with the press and i remember getting quite a, a panicky phone call from Faye uh one day in 2014 <laughs> because people were wanting to talk to her about bob mm -hmm. yes <laughs> and bless her well, Faye, tell the story, and I'll just click through here because this is Huff Post, this is the Independent, this is the Daily Mail, this is Dodo, this is the Eastern Daily Press, um, this is the Guardian, and and what I'm doing here for listeners is I'm flicking through all of these newspaper front pages showing various photographs taken from uh, an operation that Faye did on a patient called Bob. And if, uh, yep. if you can't actually see the screen, um, what you'll see here is a picture of a goldfish, probably not much bigger than the palm of your hand, um, being monitored by uh, one of my products, the, the cat Doppler, to make sure that its little heart is beating and uh, things are still going on. But you got inundated with press requests on this, didn't you, Faye? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It all started because I think they were a little short on stories. So they approached us to see what we've been up to, having been open for a while and had we done anything interesting. Right. We gave them some really cool, interesting, life-saving stuff. Right. And the goldfish one. <laughs> so what? That was what and got why not? Up. And why not? Because actually, you know, we, all lives matter. Don't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And if uh, I, I, actually, I, I always took that as a quote from from you from the uh, newspaper article. But if um, if an owner has a pet, it, it doesn't really matter what that pet is; they've bonded with it, and and uh, and, and it means the world to them. It's not, I've I've known people to be very upset because their their giant African land snail has died. Yeah. And yep. you know, it it a life is a life. Tell me how you got interested in in goldfish, in exotics generally. It was actually just because no one else wanted to do it. Um, so no one else wanted to do it. And I felt that they weren't really getting the care they wanted. So someone has to do it. Um, so then I did a certificate to try and improve my knowledge. So I actually could do the best 
care for them. Um, and the clients just found me because um, once someone's got an interest in it, everybody jumps on it. Mm. And that was it. Well, that, what, what I found interesting with that particular goldfish story was that you, I think you contacted me sometime in the morning. Um, we, we watched it spread, didn't we? We watched it spread through the <laughs> yeah. press. And then what was really fascinating you, and you'll love this, was that it was either the New York Post or New York Times or, or one of the big American papers picked it up. And we were able to track it through the night as it jumped all the way across America to San Francisco. And wow, really? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. The story literally went round the world. Yeah. Gosh. The times, I don't, I don't know. I, did, I don't think we managed to get it across the Pacific, did we? But, um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it, it was certainly See, a transatlantic story. It was fantastic. It was. So you, you could calculate the speed of media. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 You could almost, <laughs> seriously, you could almost track it, you know. It's 10 o'clock in the UK. That means it's five o'clock in Washington. And the story is <laughs> yeah. Bob the Goldfish. Wow. Yeah. It was Amazing. It was absolutely mm. fabulous. Fabulous. What sort of proportion of, of your cases are the so-called exotics? As a practice, we're about 40% exotics. Um, and then personally, I'm about 55% exotics. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice mix. We still get some good sort of cats and dogs as well, so it's a nice mix. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. good. So when when you bring other vets into the practice, because you've got you've got a couple of vets working with you, haven't you? So do you yep. bring them in to deal with all patients like you do, or do they come in predominantly to deal with cats and dogs? What's a little or, bit of both. Right. Um, so they all will deal oh. with everything, because obviously out of hours you kind of got to deal with whatever you've got. Oh, sure. um, some of them definitely have a preference. I've got one that wants to start an exotic certificate this year. Right. Um, so that's obviously, she's seeing more of the exotics because she's more interested in it. Yeah. Um, the others will see them, but predominantly see cats and dogs because that's their area of interest. They've got particular interest in like dentistry or surgery or something else. So they kind of follow that route rather than right. the exotics. Mm -hmm. so, are there any exotics that you prefer treating and the reason I sort of did a pause there was because we say exotics um, mm. and what, what is an exotic to to a vet may not be an exotic to the person who owns it but but to to most vets an exotic is an animal uh, that isn't a dog or a cat yeah to to vets that, that that have more of an interest in exotics an exotic is an animal that isn't a dog a cat a rabbit or a guinea pig and so mm -hmm. To someone who treats exotics, uh, what what, uh, what what are your favourites? Do you have a favourite or group of favourites? I haven't got a favourite as such. Um, I like dealing with the zoo species um, because it's interesting and it's not an everyday everyday kind mm. of task. Um, I like doing the stuff that no one else really wants to do because it's just nice to give them an option to actually have care and have things done mm. properly um everyone loves reptiles and birds they're i mean they're fantastic mm. um like birds of prey probably if i had to choose a favorite that would probably be my favorite um but like everything yeah yeah <laughs> and I, I read i read in one of the paper articles i hope you don't mind me mentioning the, the, the newspaper articles but you, you you you're quite famous so you know, <laughs> um mentioned uh, that you, you'd done a cesarean on on a monkey yep what, so yep really where when why what? where when how why um, what <laughs> so i've done several um so marmosets and tamarins are kept actually relatively commonly um and if they're not kept quite right they'll often get quite a low calcium level and then mm -hmm. when they get pregnant they can't give birth naturally because their calcium is too low um so we end up seeing them and obviously we correct calcium but primarily we do a cesarean to get the babies out to then help them to kind of recover and, and start behaving sort of normally again um, and to help replace that calcium a little bit um mm. so we've done several um they're good to do but the monkeys in general are not that friendly mm. Yeah. So, although and, they're and pets, is, they're not really friendly. This is a problem, isn't it, that the people have that yeah. they 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 have this wonderfully romantic idea mm. of having a pet monkey that'll sit on their shoulders and be cute mm. and cuddly, but actually they're they're not domesticated. 
No, and in order to keep them domesticated, you end up sort of feeding them incorrectly to try and make them slightly more reliant on you as a sort of mum figure, um, because that does keep them more friendly. But in terms of husbandry and, and health and welfare, that's a, an awful thing to do. So we do see a lot of husbandry related issues in exotics, which is kind of sad because mm. they are preventable if, if we do our research and we keep them properly. Um, and a huge part of my job is actually just educating how to keep things properly and what to do before you go and buy one. And is this actually the right pet? And then how do you keep it properly? Yeah. How, how, I mean, educate me on this one. How far down the, the chain, as it were, can you get a lot or do you need a license to keep? Obviously, you can't you can't rock up to the pet shop and say, I'd like that chimpanzee in the corner, please. No, so there's different levels. So you've got some which you need a DWA, which is your dangerous wild animal um, license for. Right. Um, and they tend to be your bigger, traditionally more dangerous primates. Um, the things like the marmosets, um, actually, you can just buy. And there are breeders that just right. sell them. And every now and again, they'll even appear in kind of free ads and online and things like that for ridiculously cheap prices. Um so it is a it's an area that does need a little bit more control. And we had Matt Rendell on uh, a few months back, who uh, was discussing the the the, the, the putative laws that may come in uh, to to essentially ban them. Yeah. Do, do, do you think banning is a good idea, or do you think closer regulation, if that's possible, is a good idea? There are definitely I don't want to put some words species that. There are definitely some species that should be banned because there are some that just should not be captive pets and they really they don't adapt well. And we're just doing them a huge disservice by trying to put them in our living rooms or even in sort of outdoor aviary enclosures. It's just not right. The other species, I think, tighter control is needed, but maybe not complete banning. I mean, in the case of primates, I think they should be banned. I don't think they should be pets. Um, I think it's very difficult for us to actually to actually kind of make it sort of properly for them um otherwise things like the sort of the reptiles some of the bigger reptiles things like that then they just need better control mm -hmm. mm. and do, do you think do you think legislation will work because i know um again there was the the question when we had mass on would um would people pay attention would, would people just yeah. go is, is would it be forcing people to to go a little bit more sort of back alleys uh, and then not bother to take them to the vets because that they're afraid of getting that was Matt's mm. concern wasn't it yeah, right yeah. Right and that is always the worry yeah, yeah and that is the worry and I guess that's why sort of you know on occasion when we see things that maybe don't have the right husbandry and things like that you have to kind of say it right you can't just sort of shout at people mm. and yell at them because that is part of the problem they, if they don't come back and they don't seek advice you're never going to improve the situation right. so yeah. it is a fine balance and i think tighter control but maybe without without pushing them underground but that mm. is a very difficult thing to achieve mm. and getting them to realize that actually vets well we're there to help we we, mm. we want them to be mm. better able to to keep their pets yeah. healthy uh, yep. Although there's the challenge of trying to get them better, what we really would like is actually seeing, on a daily basis, healthy pets that we can just continue yeah. to be healthy. Yeah. yeah, we're always really our clients are always really surprised because we do free of charge um, exotics clinics with our nurses, which are mm -hmm. basically just you know husbandry advice, behaviour advice, just general you know should you even get it as a pet if you haven't already got it that kind of thing. Right. Um, and people always think it's weird that it's free, but it's free because actually it helps our lives to make things better and it helps us see healthy animals. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. So, so, so you do a sort of pre-purchase advice if people are thinking mm. of getting something. That's yeah, something. or if they've kind of got it and then gone, oh my goodness, what am I doing? Um, and am I mm. doing it right? So it's, it's nice for them. How, how yeah. do you advertise yeah. that? Yeah, we, we advertise, it's probably not as much as we should because um, we're mainly fully booked all the time. So there's, there's a little bit of a waiting list. <laughs> mm -hmm. As with all free things, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but um, it, we do advertise it, and we do get a really good uptake. So great! You, you're you're based in sort of the middle of, of North Norfolkshire. We are <laughs> right. Okay. Now, now I, I've I've driven there, and I it, it's taken me 
hours and hours and hours because I got stuck behind a sugar beet tractor. <laughs> Uh, and I've seen fields and fields and fields and fields and and the hill. I've only seen the hill once. So that, no. That's in that. That's actually in Norwich, which is a big city. Well, it's not really. It's in comparison to the field, you get occasional woods. But where do these clients come from, Faye? Or have, or are you, you centred in, in, in a hub? of exotic <laughs> med- exotic <laughs> pet keepers <laughs> um so i guess it depends how exotic you're thinking so um the real exotic so a lot of the kind of weird and wonderful birds reptiles zoo species they do travel four or five hours to come to us right um mm. so a lot of those are further afield and we just collect a sort of collection of them from all around us um the things like the rabbits the guinea pigs the kind of more common bearded dragons things like that there's loads of them within the local area right um, so they're quite a nice sort of steady local community. I, I, I've just got the picture there of, of somebody keeping a, a peregrine falcon or something like that and, and going, well, I'm in Birmingham. Do I go the three and a half hours to Fay or the three and a half hours to Neil Forbes? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, actually. I, I had a phone call yesterday from... Uh, from somebody I first met at Twycross Zoo. We, we were reminiscing of uh, of, our, of the times and some of the cases we'd done at Twycross. Mm-hmm. There was a time, a good few years ago, when um, Twycross chimpanzee population was, was getting quite large. They, they have um, they have contraceptives injected underneath their, their upper arms, um, but there was a point within the two colonies that they needed to, to do some work, and and actually split out and do a third colony. And so what the, the keepers have done is they've really psychoanalyzed each and every chimp in the two colonies to work out who would be a new alpha male, alpha female, beta female, and to, to take them out of the groups that they're with now and to rebuild or to build at the third colony. And of course, what that meant in today's and to explain that to to the listeners that aren't aren't involved in veterinary medicine you don't just walk into a chimp colony grab one by the hand and walk it into another cage this is a major operation and so what we had to do is we we knocked them all down we actually anesthetized every single one of them and it was all hands to the pump because when you introduce different members from different families in in the chimp world there's a real risk that if one is a little bit comatose, then the others are going to pick on it. And mm-hmm. that may, may or may not be appropriate, depending on the hierarchy within that new family. And um, so we knocked them all down and we attempted to wake them all up pretty much in the environment, not exposed to each other, but in the environment that was going to become their new new home. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so we, we worked our way through and, and the alpha male was taken out and the, the alpha female was taken out. That was quite stressful. Um, and then we started working down to some of their offspring. And uh, one of the one of the little males, and he, he was, I don't know how old he was, probably six months, not much, not much older than that. We were concerned because of the size of him and the trauma associated with the whole thing. So we monitored him very, very closely through his anaesthetic. And um, I carried him into his new cage and his new safe area, popped him down in the hay and, and stayed very hands on with him. Um, obviously, six months old or whatever, however old he was, he wasn't a great risk to me, unlike mm-hmm. the bigger males and bigger females. And, and bless him, he, he slowly he slowly came round and his eyes opened and he looked up at me. abject terror the poor little bless him he didn't know where he was and he was faced with my ugly mug right over his holding his holding his hand and i had to, I had to call and i said uh, i managed to get his keeper um mm-hmm. working on an, on another case um she just finished and uh, she knew him very well and she was able to come in and swap over with me and, and so yeah terrorizing chimpanzees just yeah just, just another thing that's, that's the name of your autobiography, isn't it? What, Terrorising Chimpanzees? <laughs> Terrorising Chimpanzees. It could be. 
<laughs> so, so what? what the, you've had some pretty exotic cases, though, haven't you, Faye? I mean, yeah, yeah. Blonde porcupines, I seem to recall. Yep, um, we've had porcupines, we've had alligators, we've had um, leopard tortoises, or carter tortoises, obviously mm -hmm. monkeys, frogs, um, fish, obviously. <laughs> these alligators, these are from the Norfolk Fens, aren't they? Pretty much, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> who, who is keeping alligators in Norfolk? They're from a zoo collection. Right. But yeah, they're, they're very well looked after. Hmm. Right. So do you well, bring them in periodically for annual checkups and things like that? Then, or? Um, we tend to do site visits rather than sort of right. bringing them in for annual checkups. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to only bring them in because of the stress factors if they've actually got something wrong. Um, right. So the one we saw recently actually ended up needing a CT scan, right. um, which was rather fun. What, what yeah. was that? Yeah. Um, she ended up, the end diagnosis was um, discospondylitis, which is infection around the spinal cord, um, with a secondary pneumonia, which is actually quite common in alligators. It was, it was an interesting challenge. Yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, what tends to predispose them to that? Um, in her, we think it was actually age. She was a very, very senior one, but sometimes it is husbandry based, um, although I suspect not in this case. It can also just be that it's very hard to spot things. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of fungal pneumonias and things because actually it's just really hard to spot that anything is going wrong because they don't really do that much in terms of captive environments. They're not that energetic. They don't yeah. do a huge amount. So it is very difficult to spot things. Yeah. Can you tell when they cough? <laughs> not really. <laughs> not really, <laughs> no. <laughs> a, client, a client of mine keeps Kawati Mondays. Yeah. And... Um, they, they're a fascinating species. It used to be thought there were two, two species, didn't there? One Kawati, mm. one Kawati Mundis, and it turns out that they're, they're, they're just different sexes. But um, he's trying to get hold of a binturong. Uh, okay. I, I, I said, look, I, I can't condone you getting one of those, obviously, but if you do, can I treat it? Because uh, I love them. <laughs> Have you treated one? Not for a long, 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 long time. Um, I used to have a client that had some probably about 11 years ago, um, but they then finished their collection when they all sort of passed away of old age. Um, they're mm. not that common anymore. No, no. They, they went through a, a real um, phase, I think, about 10, 15 mm. years ago in this country, oddly enough, before mm. most of us had heard of them. Uh, yeah. I think they came over from the States, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Now, re regular, oh, regular... Hang on. Whoa, whoa. What? Time what? out. Time what? out. Yeah, what, Time what, what? This one. I've been too wrong. I know it's called veterinary ramblings and all that sort of stuff, but yeah. I've just had to Google that. If I've had to Google it, <laughs> I'm sure other people would have to Google it. Aren't they amazing? Aren't they gorgeous? I want one. I want one. Like they are like lovely. Sleep. They look like a cross between a Labrador and a house elf. They're incredible. <laughs> yeah. They're neither cats nor bears, but they are lovely. Mm. I, I was fortunate enough to, to hand feed one. Um, well, how, oh, how, would wow. you, how would you describe this thing? I mean, I'm looking at something like a, a cross between a, a, a yeah, bear, I, I guess... a lemur. According to this, they smell like popcorn. They do. They do. That's the amazing thing. and They, they, they really do. If you, if you smell <laughs> their fur... It is toffee popcorn. It is. <laughs> what? Absolutely amazing. Tell, tell me, look, right, I've never heard of a binturong. Where are they from? What do they eat? The, all the pictures there show this They're, sort of black, furry, friendly-looking thing with pink tongues that smells of popcorn. I think they're from Central and South America, aren't they, Faye? I think so, but I'm going to have to double-check now because it's been a long time since I've seen one. But I oh. think they. I think they're... I think they're South America. Ah, so so you know so you know they smell of popcorn. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because that's the important thing, well, right? <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're, they're very pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And they're they're probably the size of a, an average house cat. Uh, no, 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 they're not. No, they're, they're quite big. Are they? They're quite big. They they, they can be Labrador size. Labrador size. Okay. Mm. They lie so can some trees. house cats. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't be. So you. you mm. what, what, you curl up on the sofa and watch Netflix with these things? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. No, I, don't do I, this. 
I sort of feel the desire to, to, to get a popcorn smelling animal. I know, it's great, isn't it? I think that's how they designed popcorn. Probably. <laughs> I've just realised, as I have several times tonight, that I've become incredibly boring. But that's because I find some subjects very exciting. Uh, and, and, and viewers uh, who, who know me will know that my favourite uh, odd toed ungulate is a tapir or tapir. Uh, you don't deal with large animals, do you, Faye? Do, do, do you no, deal with... No, no. I think um, are pretty big, aren't they? Well, they're, they're, they're pretty big. They're pretty big. Yeah, yeah, they don't count as being large animal in our world. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no ruminant species. No, no. Um, but, but you know, you clearly know your stuff and you know your stuff very well. And I was wondering whether you, you'd give us the benefit of, of teaching us some of your stuff in, um, in, in a 60 second CPD. I could attempt. <laughs> so, what, what are you going to educate us on in a minute? So I'm going to educate you actually on IV catheters in different species. Mm -hmm. And not so much how to place them, but just really to get people thinking about where to place them. And actually, we can place them because we find that a lot of times we're... Hang, hang on, whoa, whoa. About... So, yeah, we haven't started I haven't yet. started yet. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> This is the preamble. And, and, and just setting what, the scene, Mike. And what, what we have, what we have taken a preamble, our, our viewers or listeners may not know what an IV catheter is. So if you could just... So an IV catheter is an intravenous catheter, and it's a way of getting immediate access to the circulatory system. And we use it primarily for um, putting animals on fluids, but we would also use it for giving medication. And in the context that I'm kind of particularly looking at, it's mainly for emergency access. So if you've got an anaesthetized patient or if you've got a critical patient and you need to have immediate urgent access, they're not patients to be kind of messing about with trying to get access sort of late in the day when you actually need it. So it's more geared around trying to get people to think about where we can place these so that we can actually use them to our patients' benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you raise an interesting point there, Faye, is, is getting the getting the cannula in before you really need it, because mm. invariably when you really need it, the patient yep. is probably so poorly that you can't actually get the cannula in. Yep. Um, so it's a case yep. of, of pre-preparation, isn't it? So, yep, okay. very much that so. Sounds, that sounds really good. So are, are mm. you up for a 60-second CPD challenge then, Faye? I'm up for a 60-second CPD challenge. <laughs> okay, so you're going to talk to us about IV cannulation for, for 60 seconds. I'll, I'll get the right timer on tonight. Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> yeah, 60 hours is not an option. <laughs> okay. Mucked it up. Okay, so 60 seconds on IV cannulation from Faye Bethel starting now. So in our rabbits, we would tend to go for a lateral um, auricular vein, which is the marginal ear vein. So it sits on the edge of the ear. And it's really important with rabbits that we don't go for the central auricular artery, which is the really big one that runs down the middle of the ear. Because if you do that, you can get ear necrosis. So bits of the ear can actually start to drop off and die off. Um, and it's also really painful. And obviously, we don't want to inflict pain by doing this. We use the saphenous, which is one on the back leg. Um, you can use the cephalic in rabbits, but you've got to be quite careful because a lot of them have respiratory diseases and tend to wipe their little noses on their front legs. So then they end up getting catheter site infections. In rats, we would go for the lateral tail vein. So it is on the tail. Um, and you can also use an interosseous root so you can place it directly into bone. In reptiles, so your snakes and your chelonia, you can use a jugular catheter, um, whereas lizards, you're better to go for interosseous placement. In your birds, you're going to use your brachial vein or your medial metatarsal vein, so a wing or a leg vein. Um, but interosseous placement is also a good option. Done. <laughs> Sorted. Fantastic. Spot Super on. Perfect. Spot on. Well done. Brilliant. Brilliant. What a, what a, what a great now, little CVDS. As usual, I'll struggle to shut the thing up. It, it's... <laughs> that, Mike always refers to me as the thing. <laughs> it's a sign of affection. <laughs> I like I like to think so. Oh, like to think excellent! So. What 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 a, what a good CPD on on various sites to choose to um, give fluid therapy or drug therapy to the the more exotic species. I like the rabbit ear one. I didn't I didn't know that one. Mm. Yeah, think, it mm. it looks really attractive when you clip the ear. You've got this lovely vessel right down the middle, yeah. but it's a really big mistake to use. Yeah. Uh, I always think that um, we we um, we have it so much more difficult than the human phlebotomists. 
Uh, yeah. Whenever I go into to give blood, you know, I have this huge sort of drain pipe of a vein going down the middle of my my arm, and, and they they sweat. And I, I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get a hollow chopstick down there. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> they definitely don't appreciate you saying that though <laughs> they don't, they they don't. Don't. what's interesting is is if this whole covid vaccination thing comes along it's been mooted that uh, vets and vet nurses could mm. could become mm. um mm. some of the vectors for for this and i have to mm. say um, this is no disrespect to human colleagues that i've worked with or any of my teachers in my my career on the human side but um I'd go for it every time. A black <laughs> vein in a black skin covered in fur that's half the size of one of the drain pipes running up the back of my arm. No, thank you very much indeed. So let's Absolutely. See. Well, ho hopefully the vaccine won't be delivered intravenously. It'll be well, a bad thing. But, 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 um, but yeah. who, who would you rather give you a vaccine? Someone who uh, does injections 30 or 40 times a day or someone who does it 30 or 40 times a year or, or in their career? Um I think uh, I know what I prefer. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> there we go. I think you may have just offended an awful lot of medics there. <laughs> well, we probably have, but we, we don't know what the demographics yeah. listening to the show are, and it's called veterinary ramblings. And um, we're, we're vets. We're allowed to ramble off about anyway, medics and anyway. other things we know anything about. It's okay. It's, it's allowed. Faith, Faith, they can only, <laughs> they're only allowed to treat one species. I know, I know, but we mustn't make them feel bad about it. Okay. They do wonderful things, absolutely amazing things, but they don't often inject. True. How, many GPs, True. how many GPs have you been to that have injected? Very few. Very few. And it's, it's purely a practice thing, isn't it? Yep, so, yep. Mm, mm, I remember the first time I, uh, I injected a pig. Uh, it was a vet school. And yeah, we, we, we've done our, our EMS, our extramural studies and, and injected various dogs and cats in clinics. And we did uh, farm animal practice and uh, had to inject a pig. And so you get the needle. But <laughs> doesn't go in. And so the vet I was seeing practice with said, you never get it in that way. Uh, he said, the only way to do it is this. And he took the needle off the syringe and thrust it towards the pig. It bounced off and landed in my arm. <laughs> so I said, uh, "I said, thanks, Simon. Um, can I come to you with more advice throughout my career?" <laughs> you know, oh, 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 he said, oh, he said that's, that's almost never happened before." <laughs> I like the almost never. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So what's, what's the toughest patient you've had to inject then? Own... would be the alligator because mm. right. they are really tough skinned yeah yeah, yeah. Did, did you go into the underbelly or uh, um, the no, so or acceleration? i am was into the front leg um mm -hmm. same as most reptiles so i am into the front leg and then intravenous was into the tail vein mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so yeah the tail is surprisingly thick scaled yeah so it's quite yeah. hard work to get a needle through so do you work your way between the scales between the plates yeah Right. Yeah, between the plates, and then the the vessel sits in between the vertebra. Uh -huh. So you use actually a spinal, a human spinal type needle, right. um, like they right. use for spinal taps, um, and one. then you put that through the through the scales and through the muscle, and then you just bounce off the edge of the vertebra and into the vein. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting. You don't use ultrasound to try and locate the uh, the vein. Um, not to locate it because it's fairly commonly in the same or pretty much always in the same place. Um, so we use ultrasound if we're looking for clots. So if we were looking to see if they had a, you wouldn't normally do it in a reptile, but a thromboembolism or something like that, we'd use ultrasound, um, mm. but not normally to locate the vein. Right, right. And, and you, um, just sort of segueing from, from that using ultrasound um, and going back to, to Bob, was it? Bob, it was Bob. Bob Because <laughs> that, 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 that famous was, photo of Bob. Bob was 20 years old. Yeah, yeah but, but that's not old, is it, for a goldfish? They can be 40 or 50, can't they? Mm, they can really go... He was so, older than her child, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. The, 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 the picture that, that, that you had of Bob with the um, Doppler probe Doppler, yeah. that, that, that Mike makes, th this will pick up 
the flow of blood through the yeah. um, through the heart and the great vessels. Oh, yeah. What about things like pulse oximetry? Uh, yeah. Would that would that work on fish? Because I've I've seen Mike use it on reptiles. Yeah, there's no reason why it wouldn't work. Um, we chose not to use it mainly because we were worried about breaking Mike's very expensive probe by putting it in water. Um, right. Thank you. For so that. we. I know, yeah, I showed is. consideration for my That's equipment, the absolutely. The there we go. Um, <laughs> but there's no reason why it wouldn't work. Mm. Yeah. I've, I've uh, obviously, I've, cap I've, capnography I've, wouldn't. I was right. No, capnography would definitely would not work on a no, probe. No, um, no. I've, I've, used the, I've used that probe on conscious sharks. Okay. Um, quite successfully. And, <laughs> see, and it the survived the water. I've, I've, I've used it. I've used it semi-successfully. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not used internally at all. We don't use it internally. And no? um, what what we were actually doing the, there's, um, there's there's an expression in um, in shark management uh, called tonicking, mm -hmm. and there is a similar state. Um, some some people that work with sharks, and I've been very privileged to work with some some top people with sharks, will use um, the, the the nose, just the, the tip of the nose there, to put, the, and the shark just goes more, more. I don't care more. Tickle my nose. Um, how uh, I should say other forms of elasmobranch chondrichthyum transcendental modification do exist. Well, th they do, because th the other one, tonicking a shark, is you turn the shark on its back. Now, what we don't know, or what we didn't know, no, different sort of tonic. Not the tonic you're putting in your gin, although I did see there's a very nice uh, fever tree tonic, which mixes very well as a neutral tonic. Other, other tonics are available. Uh, <laughs> They're rubbish. So moving off the tonic thing, um, if you turn a shark on its back, it, it exhibits similar behavior to a tranced rabbit. It basically just lies there. What we don't know, which is how I started to get involved in this, is whether there are the same stress factors going on. Because obviously, and, and you guys can tell our audience better than I can, if you trance a rabbit, it appears to be loving it, it's very calm, it's playing dead. Underneath the skin, there's a massive adrenaline release, its little heart is going 10 to the dozen plus, and it's, it's potentially about to explode because it thinks it's about to die. So it's doing everything it can to be appear non-appealing to the predator that is mm. going to kill it and eat it. Mm. And so what we didn't know, sharks are quite difficult to keep in captivity and some keepers will tonic sharks for various reasons but because they can sometimes they will do not necessarily for the, for the right reasons mm. so what we were trying to assess by measuring their pulse rate and their oxygenation was the effect of tonicking on sharks mm. unfortunately the sharks that i was given to work with on the first occasion we couldn't tonic in the first place so we just had to we just had to work as to whether we could actually detect a pulse rate or not. And, um, yeah, we did. We were able to monitor a shark's pulse oximetry and pulse rate externally. Um, where, where, whereabouts on the shark? A um, number of places. Um, the, the the pectoral flukes have mm -hmm. got a good blood supply. So that would be, in effect, like um, popping it into the, the armpit of, of your eye to, to pick up off the artery. Um, there is also rays of the same, and it's underneath the gill flaps, which, if you hmm. think about basic physiology, they're drawing water in across their gills to oxygenate themselves. So there's a good blood supply there, and it's a good pulsatile blood supply, which is yeah, what we need yeah. for the pulse oximeter. So uh, we were able to get the uh, get the pulse ox probe to pick up through through there. So a goldfish, I, I don't see why not. 
Never done it. Yeah, amazing. Mm. But I don't see why not. There we go. Something to try then. Faye, yeah, we'll try again. it on the next Good. one. Good. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why not? So, yeah. And, and and what about uh, so the primates? Obviously, you're going to be able to use the the same. Um, anesthetic monitoring techniques as, as you would in, in, in humans but size wise so with a pygmy marmoset is it going to have enough um, oxygen flow uh, or get gaseous exchange flow to, to, to get a reasonable capnography trace I mean presumably you'd need to use an, an inline trace rather than a Side Am I allowed to do a shameless plug for the amazing machine that Mike's got for us? Well, this is, this is, this is I'm just wondering where Julian's got this from. Where, where this, is, this is kind of what I'm aiming at. What, what, I what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm leading into... I did not into. tip Julian off about this. I have not said a word about this. No, what, what I'm leading into is that, Mike, Mike, you and I had a conversation a while ago about um, uh, gaseous flow rates yeah. and how they're calculated. And how they're calculated is almost always wrong. Tidal, tidal volume, to be precise. Yeah. Tidal, tidal volume. Of gas breathed out on each breath. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you breathe in, you breathe out, and and that 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 is called the, the, the tidal volume, the amount of of, of gas that's that brought in and out of, of whatever mix you, you're breathing in. Um, the way we're taught at vet school to calculate tidal volume is is almost always uh, wrong. And it can be dangerously wrong, particularly for the smaller species. So for things like pygmy marmosets that may weigh uh, two to three hundred grams, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And even going like even doing species smaller than that. So even things like your rats and some of your mm. um, sort of very very small leather and dwarf rabbits and things, um, we're getting down to. I mean, some of the things we're doing, we're getting down to 20, 30 grams body weight. Um, yeah, so tiny. But they, they are tiny. So, so how do you um, how do you ensure the equipment you're using can monitor those levels? Um, so we ask Mike, um, and Mike <laughs> produces an amazing machine that does these things. I mean, some of the basics apply to all species. So a stethoscope will work in everything. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like it's slightly different to sort of with your reptiles and things because you have to use slightly different techniques with those. Um, but in most of your mammals and things, you're going to get away with a stethoscope. Um, but there are some amazing monitoring equipments now. And by kind of process of elimination and trial of different species, you can actually get really good um, pulse oxes. You can get really good capnograph traces. You can get really good ECGs. Um, we've got an amazing transesophageal ECG. Um, and that's fantastic for the smaller species because Wait, you so can use it well. So, so a transesophageal ECG is... is uh... Uh, one that, that measures the the ECG or the heart trace uh, via a probe that's put down the, the throat. Is it? Yeah, Again, just, yeah, just for our yeah, viewers yeah. that, that, that uh, perhaps are, aren't medically minded. Um, yeah. And, and they're available in those sort of sizes, are they? Yeah. So um, hmm. we've got one from from Mike. Shameless plug. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's not a it's not a problem. There, there, um, there, there, I, there is no there is no conflict of interest because we're not giving any money for it. <laughs> So you, uh, you can't have a conflict of interest. Oh, that's all right then. <laughs> um, and we've used it even down to sort of rats and mice, and we get really good traces on them. Um, hmm. We've used it the other day in a leopard gecko um, and got a really nice trace on it. So it, it's working really well into really small, hmm. small species. Obviously, it's with the age-old caveat that the ECG takes slightly longer to change than your actual kind of heart rate things. Mm -hmm. um, also, in terms of kind of, you know, the age old, you can still pick up an ECG even after death in some some species and some sure. patients. Um, but it works really, really well. Cool. Um, wow. And then the, the capnograph we've had certainly going down onto kind of rats and mice. So we've had that going down onto sort of 50, 60 gram patients. Um, yeah. And, and that's mainstream nice sample rather than side stream sampling. That's mainstream. Yeah. So, are, you, are you doing laparoscopic uh, surgery? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do laps. Uh, we do either laparoscopic or open, depending on the sort of situation. But we do do it. Yeah, it's really good for things like biopsies and spaying. Um, for things like that, it's it's brilliant. Um, and even certain tumor removals are really amenable to lap, and it does have a faster recovery. So, so do you have you you you've um, alluded to, to the fact that, that that most clients are 
very caring about their pets and do the very best they can but there are a few that, that really benefit from education into into how they're kept um is there a a take-home message for these people other than researching the, the pets before they get them i guess research is the main thing but actually it's don't be afraid to ask um mm -hmm. so we see a lot of cases where clients know that things are not going well but they're almost embarrassed to ask because they know that mm. not that they've done something wrong deliberately but they've kind of got something a little bit wrong um and they're and just they're too afraid embarrassed of being to come judged. you end up seeing them really late rather than actually early in the disease where you could do something mm. yeah yeah that's yeah. the judgment um and you know vets on a whole we're not a bad lot um so we won't judge it's no know, we're no, here to help the day, yeah, we, we, we want to get their pets better. Mm. And we don't get their pets better by alienating them and telling them how rubbish they are. Mm. We get their pets better because actually we, we're interested in them as well. Exactly. All, all, uh, all animals matter exactly. to us, and, and that includes human animals as well. And we, we care about feelings, don't we? So uh, Exactly. We do, we do. Yeah. 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 All, all good stuff. Wow, well, we, we've learned... Absolutely loads tonight, haven't we? I don't know about you, Mike. I, I, I just... no, I've, no, I've learned lots as well. I mean, um, I, I, I confess that I, I wasn't aware of the, um, the rabbit cannulation thing. Um, so there's, there's a, a big learning factor for me. And bincherongs. And, and bincherongs. <laughs> That's the most important bit, obviously. Oh, that is the most important note. bit. Every day's a school day, as they say. Isn't it? Or Isn't a school it? evening, as well. <laughs> the evening after, because you guys have been hard at work all day. Yep. So, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I haven't. I haven't. I've, I've been in Zoom meetings all day today. Yeah, but I, I think I think that's that's worthy of some quality CPD and a certificate, don't you? Oh, oh, I've got a certificate. Have you? Have you done a yeah, certificate? Just, just in case. Just in case we learned anything tonight, I've got a okay. certificate. Let's bring it Let's on, see. RVC, RCVS, eat your heart out. What have we got going there on? There we go. So, so this is this is it says certificate of PC learning. Very good. See what you've done there. <laughs> and, and you can, you I like the it. Do you see the background there? See, there's Bob, Bob in the background. I like it. Says, it. Yeah. It says, this certifies that a smackerel of education has muscled its way into our souls. <laughs> oh, my God, it was good. <laughs> Don't give up the day job. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of fish stuff going on. Now, of course, uh, I'm sure Faye is well aware of this with, with uh, her extramural certifications, etc. that in order for this to be appropriate CPD, as considered by the RCVS, and we, we are applying for race, um, mm -hmm. aren't we? Are we, are we, we are, we are. I think yeah. probably, yeah. Well, as most of our listeners are from America, we, we ought mm. to. Mm. Um, so you, you can get your race points here as well. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, we like need that. key learning. We need key learning objectives for race. So Go key away. learning objectives, three of them: uh, learn, enjoy, and sleep well tonight. Fantastic. So, three KOLs. That's top really top. But to finish it off for our UK vet listeners, nurses and, and vets, um, we do of course need to reflect on the CPD that we have we have received this evening. Mm. So so Faye, could I can I invite you to join us in a moment's reflection on tonight's CPD, please. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um hmm. Hmm. See, five plays by thanks. the rules. See, thanks, she does. She does. Excellent. <laughs> great, great. Thanks. It was very good. Very well reflected. I, some I, I some of our guests, yeah, they're a little uncomfortable with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just for kicks, folks. Just for kicks. Uh, and RCVS, if someone does try to put this through as an hour CPD, I question that. Oh, so would I. Pass it. Pass it. Obviously, pass it. Pass it. Question it. Yeah. Yeah. And tune in for next week's episode. <laughs> you might you might learn something he says pointing at the camera 
Do you want a joke? Go on then. Do you want a joke? Have you got a joke? I've got a joke. Go on, I've got a joke. Now, I always try and tailor the joke to, to who we have on. And, and so I'm afraid it's a goldfish joke. Sorry, Faye. I know you do not want to be known as the goldfish bit, and you are so much more than that. However, this one seemed to fit, and it's um, it's quite a sad joke actually. It's um, uh, a neighbour uh, looks out of his his uh, window and sees the, the the next door garden, and there's a huge hole being dug by, by the the seven year old girl who lives in the house, and um, he thinks that's interesting. Digging a big hole. What's going on there? So he wanders out. He says, um, hello, Elizabeth. She says, hello. And carries on digging. He says, well, what's wrong? You seem upset. <laughs> My goldfish died. <laughs> I'm burying him. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You little goldfish. Well, oh, he wasn't very old, was he? I remember you getting him. <laughs> yeah, he's only a year old. Oh, I'm sorry for you. Oh. It's a big hole for a goldfish, isn't it? Yeah. He's inside your bloody cat. <laughs> oh, I've got, I've got a goldfish joke. <laughs> go on. Go on. Go yeah. on. There's two goldfish in a tank, and mm. one goldfish turns to the other and says, do you know how to drive this thing? <laughs> <laughs> Julian gets upset because because for 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 twenty twenty two of twenty five episodes of veterinary ramblings, he's been the only one to do the joke. Oh, well, I well not muscling in on him. No, not only that, but I spend a you know four or five minutes over my jokes. I craft them, Mike. <laughs> tosses his joke off, if you pardon the expression, and is instantly funnier than mine. <laughs> we'll do a scoring system. We'll score you both out of ten and see who wins. Best not to. I'd rather not cry. No, we, better not. <laughs> we don't want to fall out. We, we don't want to get aggressive about this. No. <laughs> well, Faye, it, it, it's been great to have you on. It's been lovely to catch, catch up with you because... Mm. You and I have sort of got a little bit out of sync with this whole COVID thing, haven't we? And, um, absolutely. So it's absolutely superb. And and if uh, if anyone listening or, or watching has enjoyed themselves, then please don't forget to click like, share it with friends or people you may find or you feel would enjoy it too. And you can pick us up on Facebook, Spotify, and other streaming platforms are available. So either listen through the podcast or, or watch the uh, the video presentation. So we thank you very much indeed. Faye Bethel, thank you very much for joining us. And may your dog go with you. May your thank dog go you. with you. May and your cheers. dog go with you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Faye. And cut. cut. <laughs> oh, do you know, do you know where this comes from? No. You're too young for this, aren't you? Yeah. I am. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Your your homework tomorrow night okay. is to look up to look up Dave Allen on YouTube. Okay. I will do this. Okay, I'll do this. <laughs> I'll, I'll bore you. I'll give you a few clues. He was an Irish comedian who used to sit on a stage on a stool with a glass of whiskey, Irish whiskey, and a cigarette. Okay. Yeah. He had a bit of a finger missing, which is why we do that. Okay, okay. And he I'm gonna be looking at this tomorrow. Right, well he used to sign off. He used to sign off. May your dog go with you. God. Okay. God, God. Yeah. May your God go with you. Yeah. May your God go with you. Because obviously he's an Irish he was I think he was an Irish Catholic, was it? Well bad yeah, Irish Catholic. Yeah. <clears throat> um and he used to say, okay. you know, may your dog a uh, God go with you. So we've we've just we just stolen it. Yeah. <laughs> We steal everything. Yeah. Shameless. We we could have gone on for ten times as long tonight. Fast. I, I, I find I'm you a bad influence. Work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, a wonderful influence. It's it's fantastic. Really, really have enjoyed having you on. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Well, uh, the uh, important point though, Faye, is, is have you enjoyed yourself? I have actually. Yeah. Yeah. Not Good. least because I got out of the GDB. <laughs> 
<laughs> there we go. There we go. In 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 what um, what breed? Uh, fine Marana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, Normally, uh, always falls to me, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how? What? So, so, tell me the words that you use to get out of this. Then he said, "I have a very important Zoom meeting that I can't miss." And do you know what their response was? Do you know what Zoom is, and can you actually use it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, it turns out the answer is no. <laughs> it, has, it has to be said, mm, not really. Hang on, yep. hang, on a minute. hang on. Despite, despite the, the little technological issues at the start, <laughs> pulled it out of the fire and you hooked it through your mobile phone? <laughs> yeah, so no. I can hotspot because in the dim and distant depths of Norfolk, our upload speed is like one whatever it is per Minute. million years yeah. <laughs> um, so, so it takes us 12 hours to send a ct series so we had to learn how to hotspot so that we could send them in like an hour rather than <laughs> all night so you you hotspot to your phone to send ct data across yeah yeah because it, otherwise we're there all night <laughs> all good stuff now we we look forward to doing this Faye, and it's um it's it's nice to it's nice to meet people and, and talk sort of talk work outside of work if you know what i mean yeah yeah mm. it is so, it is 